Thank you very much. Can you hear me at the back? Fantastic. Great. So that's my talk title. Um, I hope this is going to be interesting and useful. It's the first time I've delivered this talk to a live audience, so looking for honest feedback afterwards, uh, good or bad. Who am I? I am a freelance DevOps consultant. If you'd asked me that question a year or two ago, I'd have said I was a freelance full stack developer. A couple of years before that, um, probably a systems engineer, network engineer. The job title keeps changing, um, but the job stays the same. It's making the network work. I've been programming the internet for over 30 years now. Um, started in 1986, which is probably longer than some of you have been alive. And so I've, I've learned a lot of things the hard way, um, both as a, an engineer and a manager of engineers, but also um, I've been a programmer, I've been a, an employee. Um, I've worked for some companies large and small. BBC was the most fun I've had learning about how to really scale and what a milestone really means, because if the milestone is the Royal Wedding or the World Cup final, there is no way it's going to shift. I'm currently working as an infrastructure engineer at the Scottish Government, and, and one, a couple of my colleagues are here today, and one of them has told me that I sound awful. So thanks for that, Gabor. Really good. Uh, I've had a cold all week. I have been sneezing my head off, and I'm talking about an octave lower than I normally do. So if I have a sneezing fit, I apologise. Um, I do a side project. I always think it's important to have a side project so I've got something I can talk about at conferences without breaching client confidentiality. This is something I started for my own purposes about eight years ago. Um, it's an ebook search site like Skyscanner for ebooks but without the huge profits. Um, it's quite a complicated system deliberately because I like to play with complicated systems and this is how I learn a lot about what I do. 18 nodes in five countries. I do it as a side project, so it has to be almost no effort to keep it running because I don't have time to spend keeping the system up. Eight years of the 25 years I've been working for myself, I spent working as a startup that I founded. Um, I did the whole classic thing of I raised about half a million quid over the course of the eight years. I had investors, I had directors, I had some high scale customers like MasterCard and the Bank of Scotland. Um, my brilliant idea was digital cash. Um, I never thought it was, you know, I thought it was going to take off. Unfortunately, I was 20 years too early. So um, I'm, I'm not hugely rich, unfortunately, because of this, but it was, I learned again, a lot of, uh, I learned about running a startup and how a technical person like myself needs to engage with non-technical people to convince them of how to get them to do what you want them to. So what is a startup? So I don't know how many of you here work for startups or have founded your own. Um, this is my definition, the, well, the one that I like the most of what a startup is. And it was coined by a bloke called Steve Blank, who is, if you understand un entrepreneurship, he is one of the founders of modern day entrepreneurship. It, it, a startup is an organization which has been created from scratch and it's in search. It, it doesn't know what it's doing. It's searching for a repeatable and scalable business model. Because it doesn't know what it's doing, it has to keep searching until it figures out what it's doing so that you can stay in business. Because the first rule of business is to stay in business. So he had this insight about 10 years ago. More startups fail from a lack of customers than from a bad product. You can have a brilliant product and still go bust. This seems obvious when you say it, but actually, back 10 years ago, the way that people were thinking about what starting a, a, a startup, you were thinking about all the features. Features, features, features. Does it have this feature? You weren't thinking about what do the customers want? And they, they, they figured that here's the problem. We have lots of systems and processes for developing product. We've been doing that for 40 odd years as an industry. We know how to do that. But the startup industry is relatively new for most people. And we don't have, back 10 years ago, the processes for developing customers. So that's where the whole lean startup uh, movement came from which has a lot of qualities with Agile in software. So there's four, four phases, customer discovery, validation, customer creation, and finally company building. You get to the company building stage once you've worked out what it is you're building as a product. The two bits here that matter for my purposes of my talk are the discovery and the validation. Because you, the way you develop a successful co co company is to iterate over the discovery phase. What does your customer want? What do they need? And the validation phase, 
Can we deliver it? Will they pay us enough to make it worthwhile? So there's two fundamental hypotheses. The customer that you think is your customer has got a problem. And this is really important. This is where I went wrong with my company. They are willing to spend money to solve that problem. Second hypothesis, you can solve that problem. And you can do it for less than they want to pay. So if you can find a problem that people are willing to spend money with, and you can achieve a goal for them where the value that they get from you, what you do is less, costs less than what they're, they're benefiting from it, so the, the value is more than the cost, then you've got a business. So the whole point about custom de development in startup is iteration. You have to keep going, trying, figuring out what worked, do more of what worked, do less of what didn't, go round and round, changing everything all the time. There was a famous Greek philosopher called Heraclitus, who about 500 BC came up with this, this pronouncement which is so relevant for what we do today. The only constant is change. I've got a graph here which isn't as clear as I'd like it to be. Um, but I don't know if you can see this. There's, there's three, three lines on it, A, B and C. This is a graph that was given to me by um, Bill Owlett, who's an um, MIT professor of innovation and entrepreneurship. What he was using with this, this graph to, to, to point out was for a startup to succeed, what you have to do is either, ideally you do B. Second best is not A, it's C. Because if you are, this is for the purposes of a venture-driven company. If you're doing a, a lifestyle business, then actually you want A. But if you've taken other people's money, which most people do in a startup because they want to succeed and grow <laughs> fast, what the investors actually want, they don't want A, because that means you're having a nice lifestyle at their expense, is the way they think about it. What they want is they either want the hypergrowth of a sky scanner, which is the B curve, or you, they want you to fail fast, because then they can claim back the tax relief, they can cross you off the books, they can stop spending time thinking about you. And that is why the startup CEO should care about DevOps, because the way you succeed as a startup is do continual iteration around the idea and the technology that you're delivering. And if you cannot iterate quickly, you cannot succeed. You may not succeed anyway. You can iterate fantastically fast, but still not have a great business idea because you didn't develop the customers properly. But you cannot succeed without being able to iterate fast. So I'm going to have a quick intermission here. Here yeah, I'm doing for time. I'm talking about DevOps. What do we actually mean by DevOps? So I thought I would ask people that I know on Slack channels and in the office and on, online. So I asked these three questions. What do you think DevOps is? What do you think your boss thinks it is? And what is your company actually doing and then putting the label DevOps on it? And I got a few interesting answers back. So I don't know if, if this is large enough font for you to read at the back. Um, if you want the slides, um, I can. I can share them later. So I've got lots of great things here, um, most of which I, I agree with. Removing silos is a good one. Um, developing and owning the deployable software, that's, that's good. Making it stays live. The most honest answer I got was this one. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> because every time I talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about, they say something different. What do you think your manager thinks it is? Well, anything to do with cloud. Um, teaching an ops team how to code. Mm, not so sure about that. <laughs> Too stressed people fighting to keep the app online. Yeah, I, I, can, I can relate to that one. Uh, what did your company do and call it DevOps? Again, this is, this is um, a load of different answers. The one I, I like at the end, um, doing traditional ops but deploying it with Puppet. <laughs> but my personal favorite, and I won't, I won't name the company, that this came from, but it's a local one. Trying to avoid the machine police. <laughs> I don't know if that resonates with people, but people who don't understand what that means is, it means there's a group of people who think they own the machines, but they're getting in the way of you doing your deployment. So having the ability to deploy your own machines as well as software is an absolute important thing you need to be able to do. Anyway, back to the talk. So what is DevOps? So I have an answer to this. 
And, and I've tried this in a few situations and scenarios, and I, I, I like it. it keep, this keeps working for me. And it'd be interesting if you all have a think about what you mean by it and tell me afterwards. I think that DevOps is the use of people, process, and tools to achieve the frictionless delivery of customer value. Now, wh what that means to any particular company is going to be different. So for a startup which is selling a SaaS service, um, you might be delivering um, online accounting, like free agent. If you are, you know, e every company's got a different example of what customer value means. But the point is, if you are not delivering customer value, you don't have a business. If you are delivering it, then what you need is a combination. It's not just software, it's not just one bit of technology, it's not just a team that you put the DevOps label on. It is the combination of the people, the processes, and the tools to be focusing on where are the bottlenecks, where is the friction, how can we remove it? So here's a quick quote from Jeff Atwood, and he, if you don't know who he is, he co-founded Stack Overflow. How you measure <laughs> the health of any tech company, you ask them to make a one-line, a one-word change to a bit of text copy. No functional change, just a bit of text. How long will it take them to get that one-word change into live? I was talking with one um, particular startup in town recently, and their answer would be probably about a week, because it was quite a complicated process. It's not yet automated. It's not yet written down. Um, that's not really good, because going back to what I was saying earlier about startups, you need to be able to iterate quickly. Every time you put out a new piece of software, a code change, you're able to do an experiment. Is this a, an improvement or not? Are we delivering more customer value or less? If you can't do that quickly, you cannot get the, the success, the growth that you're looking for. So in my system, loves me, I, I thought, well, that's an interesting question. What is the answer? Um, 15 seconds to make that code change. The way I've got it set up is if I do a, um, a push to a particular branch, everything else happens automatically. So my answer is 15 seconds to make the change, and it will be on live 15 minutes later because it has to go through the process of rebuilding the images and then redeploying the images. But it's actually Docker Swarm that does the hard work of doing the rolling upgrade. All I do is just go make a cup of tea and see if it's finished. That metric is really key. So the second part of my talk title was how to convince the boss with numbers. So there's a phrase that I came across recently, four pillars of DevOps. And again, if, if this is one of the things. If you Google for what are the key parts of DevOps, you will find as many answers as there are places you found the answer. But this particular one I like, and it came from the State of DevOps report, which Puppet um, co-produced and issued recently. They do this every year, and they look at what people are doing well and calling it DevOps. What are, what are the fundamentals that they're doing that matter? And they've come up with this, this concept of there's these four pillars, and they all matter and some of them are easier than others. We have culture, automation, measurement, sharing. For the purposes of my talk, I only care about those two in the middle. Um, the other two are very important, but they're really hard. Trying to get the correct culture in your team or your company is the most beneficial thing that you can do to achieve long-term success because it means you've got better people who want to work there, you deliver better code faster because you're happier, because you're actually listening to each other and talking with each other. Uh, but it's really hard to do. Sharing, again, it's, it's something that you, when you do it, you get benefits. But a lot of commercial companies don't want to share outside their own particular company because of commercial confidentiality. Automation and measurement are the two easy bits to start with. Automation is usually where people start because they want to, for example, not do a, a build and a deploy by hand. They want to just click a button or run a script. Measurement matters because unless you are measuring it, you're not really managing the process. You don't know whether you're improving things or making them worse. You have to be able to measure what you're managing so that you can tell if you are improving it. So let's start. Well, this is the way I think about it. It goes back to the, 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 the definition of frictionless delivery of customer value. What's putting in the friction? There'll be a bottleneck somewhere. It might be a person being the bottleneck. It might be the process is ill-described, so you don't actually know how to do it, and you have to reinvent the wheel every time you do it. 
So here's the thing, identify a bottleneck. I, if you're coming to DevOps for the first time, then a good way of doing it is to start with the simplest possible thing that you can do that you can see would make a measurable change. Because I don't know about you, but I have worked in so many companies. Um, as a freelancer, I get to work in more companies than people who tend to take, take paid jobs. So I, I've got a lot of experience of what companies do that work and what doesn't work. And in a many, in fact not most companies, what they think of as the development team, they think of it as a cost center. Everything that goes on in there is costing us money and we don't want to spend money there. But they don't think that about the sales team. They think about the sales team as something you have to invest in. You put money into the sales team, you get sales back. Well, that's kind of what, what we need to change. And the way we can change it is by having metrics that show what the <coughs> company benefits by, by investing in the development thing. So you have to find a metric. You have to find something you can measure. You need to measure it. And then you need to do something that you think improves on it. Because then what you've got is an opportunity to say, well, we invested this one day of development time in this one thing. It's now saving us this amount of money. So shouldn't we do more of that? Because that's a much more compelling argument than just going, oh, you know I'm right. Just listen to me, won't you? <laughs> I've tried that one. It doesn't work. And if you can find a business KPI that you tie your technical one to, you've got a m chance of making a more compelling argument. So I'm going to give you an example. I was, I was hoping to do a few examples, but because I've had this stinking cold, I've, I've only been able to do the one. If you're interested in this kind of discussion and you want more of these, I'm planning to write some blog posts on it, so please sign up for my mailing list um, that you'll see at the end, and, and I'll be putting out um, articles about this kind of thing. But here's my example. And I kind of based it on the company I was talking to in town, but it's, it's really it's an amalgam of lots of problems I've encountered over the years. So if anybody from the company that I'm talking about is here, I don't really mean you. It's just a good example. So here is my example. You've got a company which is, on paper, it's looking successful. On paper, they're signing up customers, and they'd be able to achieve all the sales growth they need to. But here's the problem. Because of the system they've got, every single customer needs to have a new build made and configured directly for them. New machines have to be provisioned for them. It's, it's like having to build a whole system every time to get a new customer on board. And the problem is, because the company's grown fast, only one person knows how to do it. And it takes a day, because it's all in his head, or her head. And they have to keep thinking, right, well, we do it like this, we do it like this. Uh, uh, yeah, now I do this, now I do that. It takes a day to do something that actually could be made manual, but they are under so much pressure to keep putting those builds out because that's where the, they think the money is or where their bosses think the money is. They never get the time to actually do the documentation, do any training, share the load with anybody else. It's always firefighting, get that build built. So the technical result of this, you're m maximizing the amount of customers you can onboard every day to one in this scenario. I've made these numbers up. It's just, you know, I have to, I like numbers. You have, you have a maximum of one cu customer per day. Unless Joe is on holiday or is ill. In which case, it, it's zero. And Joe is so fed up with this situation. They're stressed, they're bored, they're fed up with the manager coming. No, you've just got to work later, work longer, work smarter. Just, uh. yeah, They're looking for a new job. So what's the business result of that? Well, here's a, in this made-up scenario, sales directors may signed up 25 new customers and it's the last week of the quarter and they've made commitments to their investors that they will achieve these particular sales goals and, and revenue goals and if only these invoices from these new customers could be put through and paid they would hit those targets but they can't because of the technical bottleneck if only they could be invoiced only five of them can because you can only get five done in one week Co company's going to miss its quarterly targets now in some businesses that does not matter in some businesses, it's just like, oh, well, well, we'll do it next week then. We'll do it the week after. But if you are a venture-driven company or you've got a bank loan, there's quite a good, strong possibility that the terms of that loan or that investment are tied to you meeting these targets that you promised that you'd meet. So it, the possible implication of a scenario like this where a company meets its quarterly targets because of this development bottleneck, maybe the bank calls the loan in. Maybe the investors lose confidence. Maybe the company actually goes bust as a result of things that were set in place by the fact that we missed this one quarterly target because Joe is the only one who can do it. And in a scenario like this, 
I've seen it happen a lot, where the, the technical people know what the problem is and they know that they need to fix it. They just cannot get the managers to agree to take Joe off doing that job for one day or two days so that they can then improve the process. Because they go things like, well, we have to make this change. And they, but they don't do it in a way that speaks to the way the business owners talk. So here is my possible approach to how, if I were the CTO of that company or the project manager or whatever, how I would phrase the request to get Joe off the project. It's not, we just have to do this, listen to me for God's sake. It would be, here are the numbers that back up what I'm saying. We could 10x the, the rate in which we could bring the customers on board, but we've got to get the le knowledge out of Joe's head. So we invest Joe and one other person for, for X days, and it's going to cost, in the short term, this amount of revenue. But the result will be, we'll get that money back from the improved efficiently within a week or two, and thereafter, we are going to be optimizing our revenue potential in perpetuity, and no additional extra cost going on. Now, that makes a much more persuasive argument to a, a CFO, a financial officer, or a CEO um, than just the, listen to me, for God's sake, else we'll go. If you can phrase the request that you are making of the managers and the potentially non-technical directors in a way that you're speaking their language, not your language, you have a much, much better chance of succeeding in getting them to buy into what you want. And what I've found works well is start with small wins. You have to, this is a building of a relationship because usually people in large companies, they're used to the idea of we decide, you just do it. That's not what proper DevOps culture is about. That's not sharing, that's not culture, that's, that's, that's just the top-down waterfall type of approach which we know does not work as well as a more agile, embracing, sharing culture kind of thing works. What we need to find is how do we build trust within the management, non-technical people, and the technical people so that the technical people's voices are listened to? I found it works well doing it with data and building a process where you, 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 you start this relationship with small things and then you end up building a common language and a common history you can go back to and say, well, last time I asked you for a couple of grand to do this and we saved that money in, in, in three weeks. This time I'm asking for 20 grand. Next time I'll be asking for 200. But, but, but you're building it up. You're building up the trust. And what you're trying to move the management and the directors to is a, an, a, a mindset where they are investing in the development team. It's a, it's a profit center, potentially not a cost center. Because if you can do that, then everybody is singing off the same hymn sheet and the company has got a much better chance of moving forward to success. So, thank you, that was my talk. I hope to do more of those kind of like um, uh, I studies of taking a technical problem and showing what the business argument would be for solving it. Um, if you see at the bottom of my um, slide there, that if you click on that link, you can go to where you can sign up for my mailing list. If you want my slides, I'll be putting it out on that mailing list later and also any articles that I write along these sort of lines. But thank you very much, and I believe we have five minutes for questions. So, do we have so, do we have any questions? So my question is basically, let's say I'm a DevOps or a developer at a company and I want to try to persuade uh, with the numbers. Uh, so, but I'm not the financial officer, I'm not the CEO. How would you suggest me to find out these numbers that I can use in order to persuade my uh, CEO? So we, we have this concept in, um, in the lean startup model of the one metric that matters. So the CFO should know what that is. Is it signing up the customers? Is it getting the revenue? Is it um, reducing churn? Whatever it is, they need to be able to articulate what that one metric is to you. And you ask them. That's, that's basically the question. You know, we can do a better job of, of providing you, Mr. CFO or Mrs. CEO, CFO, with the support you need to deliver that result if we know what it is we're trying to do. And just ship more code faster, more features is not a good answer to that. It's what's the metric, what's the measurable metric that we need to see going up or down? Um, if they can't answer that, you may have put an idea into their mind that maybe they should know what that is. Um. 
Da asti mis ganska. So the, the question was, how applicable are those ideas in a non-startup organisation? Well, my, my, my going back to my Steve Blank quote, I think of a startup, it can be within a large organisation if, if it is a team that is doing something which is, the, it is not yet known how you're going to do it. Any, any team which is searching to find an answer for something that can be done repeatedly and scalably is a startup in startup mindset. Um, I think that the concept of how you get developers and managers talking better to each other s works outside the startup model because where I've seen it in the um, uh, last contract I had before I was working at the Scottish government was at Elsevier, which is a FTSE 100 publishing company down in London. They are not started by any state of the imagination, but they are c th these, these ideas work there because they're still trying to produce continual change in what they do because they want to stay ahead of, they want to stay a FTSE 100 company. They've got to keep delivering new new stuff. Um, the conversation you have when everybody is focused on the same result works tremendously well. And if people don't know how, you know, what this, this the CFO might be talking about a metric which says, oh, okay, I want my PEG to be under 1.0 and I need my, um, I don't know, PE to be 33 or whatever. You don't know what that means, but you say, okay, what is it that we do or we don't do that changes that? And then they go, oh, well, if we sign up more customers, that's an easy answer, then, okay, that's the metric, because that's a metric that po both people understand, um, and so the communication is, has occurred. Um, you, you had a question? I'm, I'm around all, all day, and if anybody's interested in, in carrying on this discussion in the open spaces, I'm, I'd be very happy to do that. Um, and otherwise, thank you very much.